All right, welcome to Gateway Baptist Church this morning. We are going to turn our hymnal to 183, Oh How I Love Jesus, song number 183. And we all got to sing this together. We've got 10 in here, 10 and no more, according to the rules. And so we're going to sing as if it's 100. Amen. Each of us count as 10. <clears throat> you ready? Let's stand with you when you get there. 183, Oh How I Love Jesus. One, eight, three, and we'll sing <clears throat> all four stanzas today. You ready? There is a name I love to hear. I love to see its word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. back to you. 
We ask that you'll meet with us this morning and be with the message as we talk about Jacob's pillow. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Let's turn in our hymnal. <coughs> Oh boy, I don't want to go there because uh, I'll mess that one up. Love lifted me, 173. 173. All right, I'm going to keep you guys awake. I know you're tired this bright and early morning. So on this one, you got to tap your foot on the ground, all right? So you got to stay upbeat with it. Here we go. You ready? I, love lifted me. One, seven, three. Here we go. I will sing in deep and sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deep we stand within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Get our Bible open this morning in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter number 28. And for those of you that are at home, I've got the uh, verses up here on the screen. When we're reading these passages, and we're going to read a few. Uh, I want you to uh, think about how many times the word place, this place, uh, is used and mentioned. And so it's very important uh, in order to understand the message and where we got all this from. But, you know, it's, it's, you know when some commission wants, it's kind of just a regular reading, but two, three, four, five times, it becomes something of emphasis and focus. So we're going to focus a little bit about that. 
So uh, Genesis chapter 28, uh, when you get there, if you're able, let's stand in respect for the reading of God's word. And uh, you follow along with me, if you will, and I'll read uh, these verses, and then I might have you join me on the next screen. Verse 10, and Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angel of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. Okay, let's read verse 20, or verse 15 together. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. Okay, very important here. I wish I had you read that with me. Let's read verse 16 together. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. Now he's anointing this place. And let's read verse 19 together. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And what a powerful message. And I want to talk to you if I can uh, this morning about Jacob's pillow. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and the opportunity to be here at church this morning. Many of us, no doubt, are facing difficult times and times of grief and hardship. We ask that you'll open up our eyes to this message. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. So, Jacob's an interesting character, and I don't want to veer too, off, too far away, but I just want to bring to your mind who he was and where he came from. Uh, now, if you think about Jacob, and when you know, you know some of your personal stories about him or some of your memories, what do you know about Jacob? Krista, tell me something about Jacob. Well, there's Jacob and Esau. Okay, so he had his brother, a twin brother. Okay. And he took his brother Esau's birthright. Okay, so we know the story of the birthright. Danny? He followed God. He wrestled with God. Good one. Danny? He's the father of the uh, his, uh, 12 tribes, and he changed his, his name was changed to Israel. His name was changed to Israel, and he's the father of the 12 tribes. Great. Who else? Or some of you guys, not something else. His hip was out His hip was out of place. Good. Jackson up here on the front rows. All right. Lots of interesting stories about him. Um, he uh, has a lot of uh, attributes about his name. Um, uh, I'm going to get into some of my things here, but coming into this particular passage, if you were able to go home today, and I hope you do, you can read the whole chapter in just a few minutes. Uh, but he, Isaac told him to go to Padan Aram and marry of the house of our, of our, of our kin. And he says, your wife's uncle Laban lives out there, and you can marry one of his daughters. And I'm sure Isaac probably knew this was on the horizon if he knew his dad well. I'm sorry, Jacob. If he knew his dad Isaac well, that this was going to be part of the... He didn't want him to marry somebody of the world. And so this trip consisted of 400, some scholars say, and 50 miles. 
And so I'm mean, like, you know, oh man, this is going to be a long journey. And so, and so he's, he's tracking along in this journey to find a bride. And a lot of interesting things happen to him. And you know, it's when you're traveling alone that you get to know God. You know, you barely ever get to know God amongst, the, amongst that bunch of people together. It always is a nice feeling when you got thousands of people in one room and you're all saying they're doing the same thing. But truthfully, you're going to get to know God on a personal level more when you learn to walk alone. And Millie, um, sitting here, I can't help but think about you, but you know, you had tea with you all these years and, uh, and now you're walking alone. And so you're going to get to know God more uh, in, in that single individual path, that lonely path with him than you ever will collectively by a group, okay? And on this journey, uh, he finds a place. He comes to a place called Beersheba. And as he's departing there, the sun is setting. And he knows it's going to become nighttime. And he's going to rest and for the night. And he gets to this area, and it's a hard place. It's a rough place in his life. It's a tough place. And it's a stony place. And he finds nothing to lay on but stones. And he takes these stones and he begins to make him his, a sleeping quarters. Uh, and this particular place in his life, this heart, this place of stones, this place of hardship, there's, there's no comfort in it. <clears throat> you know, we all want comfort and empathy and sympathy in our hardships. And, uh, and I get that. It's, it's a natural tendency for humanity to want an out when we're not liking the situation that we're in. But unfortunately, uh, notice that Jacob, he takes this place of hardship, and this place, geographically speaking, and if you read the Bible, you understand that everything has meanings. Uh, it becomes a, a source of truth for all of us as Christians because it's here that we learn some valuable lessons about Jacob's pillow. And how he did not seek an out. He did not find go for comfort here. He makes the rocks his pillows. Jacob's life is surrounded in mysteries that are worthy of every Christian's investigation. He struggles from the outset of his birth, uh, having a twin brother <clears throat> and uh, which creates a contest for the firstborn's birthright. Uh, all the way through his life, nothing was easy for Jacob. Nothing. Many sayings have been attributed to Jacob. You got Jacob's birthright. You got Jacob's blessing. You got Jacob's ladder. We'll talk about that. I was going to preach that this morning. It was a pretty good sugar stick about that I could easily preach and wanted to preach this morning, but God changed my mind. You got Jacob's well. You got Jacob's fight. Uh, with the angel of the Lord. You've got Jacob's cave. You've got Jacob's pilgrimage. Jacob's brother. But I believe that the saying that best expresses Jacob is the one that the Bible seems to indicate or lean towards the most, and that is Jacob's pillow. You know, a lot of times everybody talks about that dream that Jacob had, and we'll talk about that maybe tonight or next week. But, you know, where the ladder's there and the angels are ascending and descending and so forth. And there's a good truth in that. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, that's just one little verse. We're in that phrase of that ladder and then we're out of it. And then Jacob magnifies the place again and puts oil and pours it on the stones. And he anoints the place. And he says, surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't even know it. What a great place this was. It was a place I didn't like. It was a place of discomfort. It was a place of grief and maybe sorrow for us. But you know what? This is a place that the Lord delights to stay in and be in. And it's a place where we can get to know him more and more in our life. And as we journey through this story here today, or the truths that, gleam, that come off of the story, I hope they can uh, hit home with all of us because they're very important truths, okay? So let's look at the first thing I want you to notice. And first of all, we read these verses, and I mentioned to you, I wanted you to recognize the word place over and over again. How many of you did? Did you see? I mean, I, I want to say seven, eight, nine times you'll see the word place. 
that place, referring to that location, where he was in. It wasn't the latter. That place wasn't the dream. That way, the place wasn't even the truth that came from the dream. It was the place itself and what that place represented in Jacob's life at the time. And it's also uh, relative for what it represents in our life, in our time. Okay, It's the place of hardship. It's the place of hardship. So first thing I want you to notice is that Jacob recognized the place of hardship. He's, he mentioned it so many times, he, he knew he did. Uh, we knew he did it, but I just got verse 11 here, and he lighted upon a certain place. You know, anytime you're, the word certain is thrown in front of a place, it's for identification, it's for emphasis. A certain place, not just any old place, not just some place, but a certain place. Anytime you see something like that, and it's mentioned like that in Scripture, the writer of the Bible at that time, which would have been Moses here who gave us the Pentateuch, which probably got it from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the, the, the first book of the Bible, uh, carrying it down. But, you know, they wanted us to see the emphasis here, okay? And uh, the emphasis was on this place, and he tarried there, another reference to the place, all night because the sun was set, and he took off the, and he took up the stones of that place. And put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And that's just one verse that refers to this place. But the, it just keeps on going throughout the whole narrative of the story. And so God wants you as the reader to say, I wonder if I'm in that place right now. I wonder if I'm going through a hard time. You know, I wonder if I'm in this place of a place of despair. I got a long journey here. I, don't, I could die on the trip. I don't know if I'm going to make it. What if there's no, nobody there to, to marry that, 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 that meets my criteria? And, you know, nothing was easy for Jacob, as I said earlier. What happened when he got there? He found out that the Laban had two daughters, not one, right? He worked seven years for the one, Rachel, and he pulls off a tradition amongst his kin and gives him Leah. And then Leah, uh, he marries... He marries her, he's, he's with Leah, but then he still loves Rachel. And he says, and he worked for Rachel. And then he got Rachel. And then he was married to both Leah and Rachel at the time. You could do that back then. <laughs> Can't do it now. And, uh, and he's trying to have a child with Rachel, and, and she, she can't have a child. She's barren. And, you know, nothing was easy, and so she presents her handmaid and all the other things that go on. But eventually, Benny, your truth, your, your uh, facts came out. He births all these children that become the 12 patriarchs of the nation of Israel. And it's an amazing story how through trial and error and failure and hardship and toil and not giving up and the work that's done through toil, that's what produces the results that nobody likes, that no, that everybody wants, but nobody likes to perform in order to get it. And we all want the easy cakewalk, don't we? We all want the the the, the, uh, the uh, retirement, but there's a long journey between now and then. Okay, I hope in my case, I hope I am healthy enough to never have to retire. But anyway, uh, so there's the place. Recognize the place of hardship. Number two. Jacob made the most of what he had during the hardship, didn't he? You know, Jacob wasn't looking for something that was outside of his reach during his hardship. He was looking for something within his reach. I was talking to somebody uh, a couple, about a week ago, less than a week ago, and going through a hard time, everything's a mess, and, you know, instead of looking to uh, uh, for answers and reading good material and what have you, the guy was surfing Netflix and finding out a bunch of information, just wasting his time and playing games. And you know what, this ain't the time for America to sit down and play games and, and divulge ourselves into television and Hollywood and music and drinking, you know, bars and all that stuff, the beer or what have you, not the bars, but you know, this is the time for us to do some uh, spiritual introspection, looking inwardly upon our lives and trying to better ourselves. And Jacob, during this time, he looked with what he had. What do you have right now during your hardship that will actually help you? I like what Millie said a little while ago. She pulled herself together and she started reading her Bible. She got up at a quarter to four. Amen. She started pulling a tea 
uh, uh, and, and uh, her husband, and uh, who just recently went to be with the Lord. Uh, and uh, but you know what, Millie? That's don't you feel better? Don't it make you feel more uh, like wow? I'm, you know, it takes you out of that that initial place of hardship. It has such a huge impact upon your life. I don't know if I'm going to make it. It's the hurt, the sorrow, the grief. Nobody can fill that void, but God can. And He says, "Man, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest." Draw nigh to me, and I'll draw nigh to you. You know, and God wants that relationship to be twofold. You know, the grace of God's going to kick in when you need it, but he, but for that relationship to work, it takes both of us. It takes both of us working together with God. It takes me seeking him as much as him wanting to seek me. God's, you don't have to wonder if God wants you. He does, but he's just waiting on you in your place of hardship to come to him. And recognize, hey, uh, I'm going to make the most of what I have. I got a Bible. I'm going to read it. I got TV too, but you know that's all hodgepodge. That's all uh, that's that's irrelevant information. What's going to really help is when we turn off the TV, turn off our pleasure-seeking music and money, and we're worrying about all the stuff and how it's all going to happen, and just start reading our Bibles and trusting the Lord. God's going to provide. If we just hang on and do what he wants us to do. He always has. He always will. He made the most of what he had. He took the rocks from where he was and said, It's not the most comfortable thing I ever slept on, but it'll do. It just happens to be where I'm at. And I'm not going to seek the flowery beds of ease when I'm, when I'm living in rocks. If rocks be my place, so be it. Rocks, it will be. And I will make my bed in rocks. Why be something or somewhere where I am not? And so I always tell people, it's okay to grieve. It's okay to sorrow. It's okay for trouble. It's okay for hardships. Let them come. There is a great reward in them. Okay? So he made the most and, uh, of what he had. And number three... He may do with what he had. Uh, by taking the stones of that place, you know, we often think the answers to life, and I just kind of reiterate this point, are elsewhere, don't we? You know, when we're going through our hardship, we're looking at the opposite of what's bringing the hardship. If it's a financial crisis, well, the answer is money. If it's health co conflict, then the answer is, is good health. You know, we're so human, we're so carnal, but we never think, why? Am I in a place of financial hardship? Why am I in a place of, of physical crisis? Why are my relationships with others on the rocks? Where have I lost my influence? What, has, what's take, what do I not possess that I need so desperately? And it's that look in that causes you to question yourself and question your relationship with God and maybe bring it higher and make more of yourself than you've ever thought about before. And I think that's what's great about this. So he may do with what he had, taking the stones with where he was. And he didn't seek elsewhere other than where he was at the time. And I want you to think, you know, uh, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. And, you know, God's going to come through for you. And he's going to use, listen to me, what you currently have now not what you don't need later to get the job done. You know, it was the, the boy's five loaves of two fish that fed the 5,000. It was the widow's two mites that satisfied Jesus Christ. It was the lady's ointment that she anointed the feet with Jesus that made it happen. You use what you got, you take what you have, and you place it in the hands of the Savior. And if you've got a life, let it shine. If you've got ability, Go to church. If you've got the wherewithal, do what you can do. And don't compare yourself with everybody else. Just do what you're supposed to do. And you will learn to be happy with that. You will learn to be content with that. And you don't have to compare yourself. And I'm glad that we don't have to. Jackson, I don't want you to be ever be another Danny. You don't have to live in Danny's shadows. All these years, you're trying to catch up to him. Don't worry about Danny. I don't want two Dannys. I don't want two Jacksons. I don't want two Shelbys. And God don't want duplicates either. He don't want duplicates. 
He made us all different and unique. There's a reason for it. Be yourself. And be where you are. If you're a little less smarter than this guy over here, that's okay because God made you a certain way. If this guy, you may be a little stronger than that person. You may have more common sense than another person. We all have things to contribute, right? We're all where we are. So that's the place that we're in. And we've got to magnify that place by using what we have, not what we don't. Everybody says, well, when I get, then I'll give. So I'm not going to, so you won't give with your little two mites now. You know, God didn't magnify the great big mega offerings of the Pharisees. He only condemned them. So all this stuff, all this big time giving, this big time showboating. Oh, I'm sure there was hundreds of rich people in the Bible. Nicodemus was rich, wasn't he? He was a pretty heavy influential person amongst the Sanhedrin. One of the key players in, in the group. And Christ, right off the bat, was criticized him and hit him right, right on the worst thing. His salvation, being born again. Question is Bible theology and everything. And we got John chapter 3 out of that. I'm just trying to tell you, folks, listen, God's not about uh, you know, all that. He says, man, learn to do it where you're at. Learn to take what you have now and make good use of it. You know, we don't have to worry about filling some church we don't have. Let's just fill the one we got. You know, we don't have to worry about all that stuff. God will supply that need when that need arises. We got to fill the needs and maximize what we, the capacity and what we have now, right? So let's do that. Number four, Jacob, and this is a big one, Jacob included God into his hardship. Here he was, he's on this long journey, he's wifeless, and he's been commissioned, and he's set off, and he's just left Beersheba, and he's made it into this hard place of his life, and he don't know, even probably if he's going to make it to Paden Aram, a 400 mile hike. He's already traveled a good a while, by the way, just to get where he was, not, not that much, but he's, I believe uh, Beersheba's uh, in the vicinity of Syria somewhere north of Israel a little bit, uh, modern day. But notice this, he uh, includes God into his hardship. Hardship wasn't at the expulsion or exclusion of God. He embraced every hardship as the inclusion of God, didn't he? You know, a lot of times people think, for, you can tell by their attitude, by how they are. We'll get the attitude here to say, but the first thing they do is, woe is me. Woe is me. I got all this stuff. Don't you feel my sorrow? Don't you know my pain? Don't you know my brokenness? Don't you know my brokenness? I ain't got no money. <laughs> it all disappeared. You know? The attitude of people. I like what Billy was talking about this morning, how the Lord just provided God just came through here, came through there, came through here, and came through there. And before you know, she's, uh, you know, it all worked out. That's one of the first things I always pray when I ever meet anybody that has a, a passing of a loved one. First thing I do look to is I try to find a way that I can contribute to help their needs. Second thing I try to do, the first thing, and the first thing I pray though is that God would supply their needs and help them to have what they need to make it through. Because nobody wants to carry the burden. After the fact, it's a heavy load to carry. Your heart's bad enough, you're already grieving over the loss of a loved one. And praise the Lord that God provides. Amen. But you know, during your hardship, it's important for us to realize the, the necessity to include God before we pick up the phone and call mom, before we pick up, pick up the phone and call dad. Let's get on our hands and knees and call on our Heavenly Father and say, God, there's a need, there's a reason here. And I'm looking to see it. I want to know about it. I got to know if you got a plan for my life. I got to know if there's still something in me that I need to do. And, and if that's the case, and you show it to me, I just want you to know I'm willing to do it. So, you know, when you have a hardship in your life, you're going through a hard time, nobody knows it like you, include God. Don't push him out. Don't read less Bible. Don't be less faithful to church. It shocks me. 
And I don't want to be judgmental, but it's kind of hard not to be as a pastor when people come to me and they tell me how their lives are just falling apart. I can think of several people this morning. And, and nothing seems to be working. The things they need to do can't, aren't being done. There's like a divine presence keeping them from being able to do all the things they need to do. And, you know, during their hardship, you would think that they would be in church every time the doors are open, but they're not. I'm, I'm thinking about not the ten that have eased over here and we've kind of done our six-foot roll with, with the disease and stuff going around. But where's all the ten that could be over here? There's plenty of square footage here. I'm not going to bark if 20 people shut up. You know what I mean? And I've tried to keep it down to minimum and so forth. And there's some people I've, we want, we don't want to come, to be honest with you, because they we don't want to be the reason for an exposure to them because they're, they're a prime candidate for the disease of, uh, and what have you. But, you know, there are some young, healthy people that are going through really hard times and people that should be here this today and are not. And, you know, they're not including God in their hardship. And can I tell you something? It's important for us to take the stones that we are seeing all around us as a sign to include God in this particular situation. Uh, Jacob included God in his hardship. Uh, and notice I put something up here. I've been reading a, uh, uh, another book. I can't think of the name of it. What was the name of that book? Uh, it was a... Uh, can't think of it, but anyway, I got some ideas from it, and I was thinking about Jacob here, and it was about a, the guy was talking about attacking problems. There's two types, these two different kind of two different types of people, and I paraphrase this, put it in his own words, but you know, um, there are those that attack the problem, okay, and then there are those that blame the problem, and the people that attack the problem they have a different attitude. They're like, oh, because I've been faced with a hardship, I'm going to go to church. Get it? I'm going to be more devoted to God, or I'm going to, or how, or they look at themselves and say, how can I change? Because I don't want to be miserable forever. I don't want to be in this place longer than I have to be, or whatever. So I want to, I want to, how, how can I change? How can I be a better person because of this? And then see, they, they're thinking about things they can work on. You know, and maybe even during this time, you know, they're not afraid. They're not opting out helping other people during their hardship. You know, one way to get out of yours is to help somebody else through theirs. <laughs> I found that out many a times in my life. And so, uh, so that's the different attitude. Attack the problem. You got some people that will attack the problem, but those are only 10%. Most people will blame the problem. Well, woe is me. Here's the problem. This is why I'm here. I was going down the road the other day and Somebody rear-ended me, and they didn't have insurance, and now my vehicle's totaled, and blah, 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 blah. And they just hit you with their, their junk. You know, and I didn't have rent or, or, full, or the coverage of that non-insured motorist, and I didn't, so I'm out, and now I'm looking for this, and now I'm looking for that. Or it's, uh, my husband let, left me once more. Well, good night, if you want as much as... As you do in front of me, I don't let you too. No, <laughs> no, but you know, it's the woe is me attitude, right? They blame the problem. And you know, they never they're fa they fail to see that the problem is there to make you a better person. The problem is there so you can enrich in your relationship with Jesus Christ. The problem is there so God can talk to you. He can talk to you. I like that one. Number five, and let me flip through this and we're almost out. Number five, Jacob came to recognize that the place of hardship is the place of God's presence. You know, I don't know about you, but during the COVID-19, you know, we lost Vince to covid he was one of my first ushers. He was a charter member. You know, he had, uh, he was 
his, he was born in World War II, and his dad, or his mom, his dad was in the war in, in the military, and his dad, his mom dropped, couldn't take care of him, and she dropped him off at the St. Mary's Orphanage. He never got to know his mom, real mom and dad. His last name, come to find out later, wasn't even really Christmas. Here's a guy that overcame. Also, as a little boy, he was stricken with polio, another virus that hit America really hard in the 40s. His one leg grew crippled and the other one, and whenever he took the offering, you know, he limped around the church like that. Here's a guy that worked hard all his life, had a job, made something of himself. His first marriage, he had three, he even had kids, three boys. Can you believe it? Went through all that. And then things didn't work out. I don't want to get into all the details, but you know, but he ended up losing. Eventually, he lost his first wife. And uh, I preached her funeral ten years ago, her homeboy service. And then he met the love of his life, Elizabeth. And that was my first marriage, right here in the church. And I think almost all of you, except for Jimmy, probably were there. And then, you know, he he's on quarantine, and somehow he ends up getting. COVID-19, even though the place was kind of doing the right thing and all protected. And there goes Vince. But before Vince, a week and a half, you always saw Vince taking the offering on this side, and you always saw Terry on the other side. You know, and uh, Terry, big muscular guy, and he would walk around and he would take the offering. I was thinking one day, I said, I need two guys I can trust and depend to take the offering in our church. And the first two people, I, I immediately kicked Betty out of that one. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, I'm playing. But I, uh, but I, the first two people at that time that came were mine were Terry and Vince. I just felt like that was a good job for those guys to do. And I lost both of those guys. We lost them as a church. And Millie and Elizabeth lost their loves of their life, you know. Terry, you know, oh my goodness, he worked with the uh, elderly all in years. I would talk about, he would come to work, he'd have a little limp, or his back would be hurting or something, and I'd be like, Terry, what's up? You know, because you look at the muscles on him, and you thought, surely he's just, he's okay, but he's like, oh, my pastor, it's always lifting them people in and out of the bed, and things you gotta do. And, but he helped people for all them years. And he was a giver to our church. He was a just a great guy. He tried to be here. He was just here a couple weeks before he passed away. Uh, you know, uh, he was here our last service together before we had to shut it down when the city told us to. But uh, what a shock it was that we lost Terry. And Millie did a great job during that time. But you know, during these times of hardship I've seen something I've seen that in the darkest hour of Elizabeth and the darkest hour of Millie because I'm the pastor and I'm able to be there kind of in a way I saw the glow, I saw the grace of God I saw the Lord kicking in, you know where our weakness couldn't make it and God's presence was in that place you know, even in that hospital over there, it's amazing how the Lord made them doctors have a conviction about how they treated our people. They knew there was something there. They knew there were people that loved these people. Mm -hmm. And the funerals were sweet, and people were saved. I think both of Terry's daughters mm -hmm. raised their hand for salvation. His nephew raised his hand. Uh, for salvation, Daniel, right? Yeah. And he was a good guy. I really got a chance to meet him. He said, Pastor, he's like, I haven't been in church in a long time. He said, but when I do, when this thing's over, I'm going to come to your church. <laughs> and uh, sure we'll hang on to him. Yeah, Daniel's a good guy. I like him. But uh, I'll tell you, you know, the Lord, one of the great truths about the hardship, the place you don't physically want to be, Actually, is the best place you'll ever be because it's there that the presence of the Lord is there. Got Jacob understood that God comes in, comes into your life during these times. And it's important for us to realize that if you're not in the hardship now, 
put it down in your file. You'll need this tomorrow. You'll need this next year. You'll need this later. Hey, uh, that hardship, uh, if you're not in one now, you are, will be someday in the future. So he recognized the place of hardship as the place of God's presence. The Bible says Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. The greatest mistake of all Christians would be to think every single time we go through a hard time. Oh, that's because you didn't pay for this. Oh, and we point the blame. Oh, that's because of this. And that's because of the pastor. And it's because of the, my job. And it's because, no, could it be that God wants to just, you're actually okay and there's nothing wrong with you and God just wants to talk to you and let you feel his presence? You know, it's all, we, one of the things I think the biggest grief of losing a loved one is you, you, that, that comfort of just knowing they're there. You know what I mean? And God, he's here. We don't know it, though. And God says, you know, I want you to feel me. I want you to know I'm around. And in this, so I'm going to put you through hardship so you can realize, hey, my presence is here. And there's nothing like that feeling. There's nothing like it. That's what you need when you're taking your test. That's what you need when you're going, when you're facing the unknown. That's what you need when, when, when doubts and fears arise. You need to, you need to know the sureness of God's presence and where God is, folks. There's no place for fear. There's no place for failure. There's no place for, for doubts and skepticism. There's no place for hatred. It's a wonderful place. God, when God's presence shows up anywhere on the earth, it revolutionizes it. I like what Ezekiel calls the place, the name of the city. He calls it the name of it, the Lord is there. One of my Bible professors said, uh, he was arguing with a Jehovah's Witness, and they were talking about heaven and where it's at and all that, and only 144,000 are going, supposedly, and all this. And he's like, I don't care where it's at, what it is. He's like, wherever the Lord is, whether it's on the, on the point of a pin, that's where I'll be. You know, you're just going to be wherever he is. And Christ said that where I am, there ye may be also. And folks, wherever Jesus is, wherever God is, that's where heaven is. Okay? So don't, don't fear. And so you get a little touch of taste of heaven whenever you get the presence of God in your life. Isn't that wonderful? I think so. And let's go on. I'm almost trying to get through these. Number six, Jacob anointed his hardship. You know, it's one thing to say, I, I, I'm going through such a tough time. But then when you get to the presence of God and, you, and you've humbled yourself below the circumstances of, of the hardship and of all that you're dealing with, it's at that particular time that, that you realize the importance of this and why you're glad you went through it and what it means to you moving forward. And at that time, Jacob gets out his anointing oil and he pours it over those stones. And he says, and his attitude is, in a way, thank you, Lord, that you know what's best. We didn't, I didn't, I wanted him here, but I didn't want him to suffer. I wanted him, I wanted to get out of this situation, but not at the expense of you. I didn't want poverty, but Lord, I mean, it made me rich, and I'm so grateful for it because I learned to look inward. And my heart's just rich for the relationship that I have with you. I didn't want to stay at home all this time with the COVID-19. Maybe that's you. But boy, I've really enjoyed getting in the Word of God and learning about things that I've never seen before. Hey, I don't know about you, but I hope that your hardship you get to the place where you anoint that hardship, where you think highly of it. I think of my son's diabetes. Danny has a special gift, and you guys know it when you meet him. Everybody knows he's got some things about him. But it's because he's, he has accepted his diabetes as a, a hardship from God, a thing that he can use in his life. And because of that, he's able to be a help, isn't he? He's able to show others, you have a hardship, let me show you what I do. 
You know, there's no accident, Jackson, that you have asthma. There's no accident in it that I have migraines and Krista has RA. People say, everybody runs from their medical diagnosis. I want my family to say, hey, you know, in the end, let me just rewind the clock. Everybody's leaving from something, folks. In the end, it'll be cancer, COVID, viruses, flus, heart attacks. It'll be something. We're all going to leave by something. Okay? But the medical world seems to think they're deity. And so what they do is they, they microscopically examine every human being and they find flaws or DNA mishaps and uh, you know where where the cells uh, go bad on a cellular level or what have you. They're always trying to change man's makeup because it's a mistake, it's an accident, it's a flaw in them. And I want to help you with your flaw. Hey, let me tell you something. I'm glad that they're there to prescribe us antibacterial or medicine and what have you, and uh, uh, give us uh, pills when we're you know certain things that will help us overcome uh, sickness and bacteria infections and what have you. But, but at the same time, I'm against them with their philosophy of the labeling of every human being that's on the face of the earth. Because you look at these doctors, you know the average lifespan of a doctor isn't too much. You know, they ought to be looking at themselves before they start looking at everybody else. And they ought to be reason, looking in this word right here and learning about what God says life is and what life's all about and why humanity has so many difficulties. You know, God made us with the capability or with a reproducing process, yes, but also with the law of entropy, which means we are set to fail. Because, see, life never was about the here and now. It never was about the mortality of humanity. It was about the spiritual man that can come into humanity and enlighten him to the afterlife, to everlasting life, and reconnect him to his creator. See, we're flawed by sin. And God says, no, I can't have a makeup down there that can live forever in, in a sinful body. It's not going to work. Man would become so corrupt it would never work. Well, Satan would probably like that. You know, Satan would definitely like that, I, I believe. He can use it. So this idea of getting into the healings and the superstition, and whether it's through in, in a superstition in church services, or we're all flawed. And I have come to just accept that, and I want my family to accept, hey, I'm a diabetic, I have rheumatoid arthritis, I'm going to fight it, I'm not giving in to it, I'm not using it as an excuse to fail, but I'm going to first use this in the face of God, and I'm going to look inward and see what becomes of it. And you know what we might just find? We might just find the presence of the Lord is in this hardship. And lastly, Jacob declared all hardships, or this particular hardship, we could declare, as notice, the house of God. Okay? Uh, so Jacob validated the blessing of God from the hardships of God. Look at, look at number seven here. Jacob declared hardships as the house of God and the gate of heaven, and he called the name of that place Beth El. Beth is the Hebrew word for house. El is a generic term for God. So, and so you've got the house of God. And so you know what? You want to go, everybody wants to say, I want to know God. I want to dwell with God. And I want to, we got to know what that means. I'm willing to endure hardships. I'm willing to suffer. I'm willing to go against my carnal brain. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what Jacob came to realize. And so these truths, they're amazing. And this is Jacob's pill. Some of the, hard, some of the hardest times in your life, and I will just tell you this, you will look back on in your life 
at a future date. You won't during the hardship, but at a future date, you will look back and you will praise God. You know, Jacob, he got to the place where he knowing that altar. And he thought differently about it. And he projected praise and worship and joy to God. And you know, what an amazing attitude adjuster it is. And so I face today's hardship because I faced in one of yesteryears. You know, I didn't want to go through that situation with joy, like on purpose. I mean, or, you know, I had to accept that this was God's plan for her. You know, I'm glad I never asked God to change her. I'm never I'm glad I never asked God to heal her. Oh, a lot of people ask me. But what if I asked God to heal her and he never did? What would I have said as a dad? God, I don't like the daughter you gave me. I don't like something about the daughter that you gave me. You know, I'm glad I feel like God has no mistakes. I never prayed that prayer, and my heart is a blank, clean page today. I've never one day of joy seven years, and I was with her all seven years, every day. I've never one time entertained the thought, one thought, I wish she wasn't in this situation. I wish this wasn't her. I looked at her every day with a smile and said, I'm so thankful for you. You're such a beautiful little girl. And you know, I have no regrets for that. Why? Because it's in the hardship that I get to know the presence of God and I realize that this is where God dwells. This is his house, the house of God. I look back at those times when we were up in that upstairs 100 year old building where the roof was falling down the mold was in the building and everything we moved here with 25 cents in the bank and i thank god and i praise god wow I'm so glad our family did i look back when i was a little boy when we slept on uh, tile floors any mom didn't even have enough money to put us on beds our dressers weren't real dressers they were cardboard boxes that our great grandma came down from St. Louis to Jacksonville Beach, Florida, and bought us cardboard dressers, and we folded them up and made the dressers work out of them. I'm glad that I remember eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and bologna sandwiches for times where it was like it seemed like a year or two. I hate bologna today. I hate it. Sorry, that's the one thing I turned down. Raw bologna, I can't stand it. But can I tell you something? The memories they stuck with me all those years where everything was seeming like it was going good I barely remember them but you know God was in the hardship I remember going to Jacksonville Beach and or the church there on Jacksonville Beach uh, the Baptist Church they picked us up on a bus I got my first introduction of Jesus Christ and God outside of my mother from there and the seeds that were planted one day when I was 20 years old came to fruition. But you will someday look back on today's hardship and you will praise God. You will thank God that he knew what was best. Let's bow our heads and pray. I don't know about you this morning, but are you going through a hardship? Are you rejecting the stones? that are before you. Why don't you make them your pillow? Why don't you humble yourself? You know, man in his best state's altogether vanity anyway. None of us deserve heaven. None of us deserve God. Who are we to point our finger at him and say, God, this ain't fair. This ain't right. I'm not worth, I shouldn't be going through such a hard time. Maybe we ought to change our attitude and say, God, you are perfect. You are holy. You are righteous. And you, Lord, I don't understand it. But at this time, I want to say, you make no mistakes. And don't let my will be done. Lord, let your will be done. In my life, right now, in this hardship. And I'll be 100% satisfied with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's see. Now I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. If you need to pray, you can. And
you want to sing along with us, let's do that, okay? Jackson, let's stand up, guys and ladies, and we'll sing this together. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me. 